Well, good morning. We're going to be looking this morning at rights, expectations, and roles in marriage. Actually, we'll be saving the roles pretty much for next time, but we'll discuss a little bit this morning. Thriving marriage in an upside-down world. And that's exactly what we have today. Morality and everything seems to be completely upside down from what it was when we, that is, the majority of us elderly, were growing up. <laughs> marriage in the family. Now, we're going to be talking the next couple of weeks on uh, who's in charge or what's another way of saying that? Who wears the pants in the family? And what can I do about it? Okay, let's, uh, let's begin with prayer. Father, we thank you for this time together. Uh, Lord, this is a, a very uh, important, essential, vital topic for, for the church and for the family. Lord, we pray that you'll give us wisdom and insight into the scriptures and uh, observations that are based on them, as well as the observations you've uh, allowed us to have through the through the centuries, uh, just observing the differences between uh, men and women and boys and girls. And Lord, just help us to see how uh, we can navigate through difficult uh, times that we are facing now, uh, when there are multiple. Uh, issues and uh, multiple organizations and communities and uh, educational and government agencies telling us that uh, things that are found in the scripture are just myth and they don't have any relevance to today. Lord, show us that they do and show us how to abide by uh, your, uh, your scriptures and make them the rule for our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Some of you have heard this uh, before, but uh, pardon me if uh, <clears throat> if you, you heard it again. There was this couple, both of them were 60 years old, and they had been married for 40 years. And they got a surprise visit from an angel and said, it's remarkable the commitment you've had for so long. He says, uh, God said that he wants to give you a special gift. And he asked the woman, what would you most like it, uh, in life? And she thought about it a minute and said, I love to travel. So he flashed his sword and he gave her two tickets for a worldwide trip. And, you know, she's delighted. She's looking at these, you know, uh, just trying to figure out where they're going to start. The husband pulls the angel aside and said, what would you like? He said, well, I'd really like, and he kind of turns away from her, I'd really like to be married to someone 30 years younger. Said, no problem. Takes his sword, he flashes it, and instantly he's 90 years old. Uh, there's a difference in the, in the way that we think and we uh, sometimes our, our dreams and aspirations and expectations, and that's what we're going to look at today and I've kind of uh, titled this uh, t this particular uh, subject today is Together at Last. You know, this is uh, essentially what Daryl was looking at to begin with, leaving and cleaving, actually beginning the uh, unit, talking about the elements of marriage. And we'll review just a, a second, but, you know, what is marriage? And the definition that he gave uh, comes from Tim Keller. Marriage is a lifelong monogamous Relationship between a man and a woman. I mean, one man, one woman. Uh, according to the Bible, God devised marriage to reflect his saving love for us in Christ to do several things. To refine our character, to, to improve each one of us, to create stable human community for the birth and nurture of children. I know that's part of it. And to accomplish all this by bringing the complementary sexes, that means working together, uh, into an enduring whole life union. Uh, a lot of words there, but we'll look at it in just a, a minute. Uh, and we'll look at a couple of these other things that are on here also. You know, marriage is not a 50-50 contract. When I was in uh, high school as a 12th grader, I thought I knew a lot more than I 
I realized I did know. I wrote a, a paper, and my teacher thought it sounded good, but I looked, I've still got the paper. I looked at it, and I realized it was terrible. I, I called it uh, a contract, which, uh, you know, we're going to look at that in a minute, a 50-50 uh, proposition. And that's totally wrong also. Because if you only go in giving 50% and they give 50%, you don't get 100. <laughs> uh, you don't get much of anything. Uh, you've got to go in with 100%, each of you. Um, but uh, Daryl didn't have much time last week to talk about uh, how marriage is, is not really meant to be a contract. It's meant to be a covenant. So we're going to talk just a couple of minutes about that. The, um, the word covenant is in the Hebrew, the word berit, uh, and it's basic means like a cutting. And you can picture this when God made a covenant with Abraham. Anybody tell me what he did? What did Abraham do? Well, he did, but he did. He probably got the sacrifices. He got them, killed them laid the two halves, and then he went to sleep. Then what did God do? God walked between them, or his spirit went between the two halves. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But there is a, a sharing of goods. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, 18, I mean, uh, David and Jonathan had a covenant. And Jonathan gave David all of his, uh, you know, like his, his sword and his mantle and everything, saying that, you are the rightful heir to the king, to the kingship, not me. And so he was making a covenant with, uh, with David. Uh, there's usually a striking or shaking of hands. Uh, and sometimes people think, uh, anybody ever, no, I never did it, but it, I knew about it, becoming a blood brother with somebody else. What, what do you do? You cut your hands and do what? Okay, that I... Uh, some people think that may have happened uh, here uh, sometimes. In Job 17, 3 and Proverbs 22, 26, it talks about striking of hands. Uh, and it may be a picture of that. There's also stipulating of vows. Um, now, Jonathan wanted something from David in that relationship. Does anybody remember what it was? What's that? Pro protection for who? His family. He says, you know, when you are the king and everything, you know, what do you kings usually do when they come from a different family? Usually they wipe out their predecessors and all of his family. Jonathan said, please don't do that. And later on, there was a, a, a lame prince by the name of Mephibosheth that David took care of and put at his, his own dinner table uh, and ate, ate with his family. So David fulfilled uh, uh, his particular vows. Uh, we talked about the symbolic ceremony a second ago. Uh, but there's also something else. There's the sharing of names. I don't know if you ever thought about that. Uh, in the later on, even Jesus mentioned it. God was identified with Abraham, with Isaac, and Jacob. He is the God of Abraham, the God of Abraham, the God of uh, Isaac and Jacob. And also sometimes you'll see the name like Jezreel or Israel. The E-L at the end is God. So the, the, uh, the two names uh, come together. There's also a sharing of the reputation. And that's the thing that, that God was so upset with his people about. He set them in, in the Old Testament to be a what to the Gentiles? to be a light to the Gentiles. But what did they do? They became like the Gentiles around them and their idolatry and adultery and all of this. And it brought shame and disrespect to the God of Israel. Now, the reason I bring all this up is because a wedding ceremony contains many of these elements. Did any of you know that? Usually in a, in a covenant, there's always a uniting, uniting of two parties. What two parties are being united in a wedding, at a wedding? What's that? 
two families, not just two individuals, but two families, two distinct families. Uh, now, the bride goes down the aisle, and usually you have his and hers or whichever side they're on, uh, families, and they act as what? Witnesses, okay? Now, oftentimes when David and Jonathan uh, did their vow, what they were, uh, essentially they took oaths and they say, God do so to me like these sacrifices and more if I don't uphold my end of the bargain. And so these, what, you know, what the sacrifices, they were dead, the dead halves, and said, I'm going to become like one of them if I break my vows. Um, then there's a sharing of rings. It's uh, kind of reminiscent of the, the rainbow from God's perspective. Uh, it was a picture of his uh, everlasting fidelity to his people. Uh, there is a shared uh, communion, a reception. And even there is a, you might say, a shaking of hands, although it doesn't look, look like shaking unless the, the guy's shaking in his when he's holding their hand up in the front when they're exchanging their vows. Then there's a signing of the marriage certificate certifying that the issue is settled before God and man. Okay, then there's a, the sharing of names. Uh, contracts don't emphasize moral obligations, uh, but covenants are based on the Christian characteristics of steadfast love, through servanthood, virtue, and faithfulness. But all this made possible because of the indwelling Spirit of God. Now, I've got a, a picture here. A contract is it's a legal agreement, whereas a covenant is a spiritual commitment. It goes deeper than just the, the physical uh, and emotions. Oftentimes, there are time limits but with the covenant, it's a, it says it's promised till death do us part. Contract is generally self-centered. Said This is an exchange of good. So it's a, they're thinking about what he is or she is going to get out of this thing, out of this relationship. Whereas covenant is other-centered. What am I giving to this relationship? My life, my all. Contracts are conditional. If this, then this will happen. If not this, then, you know, we can do something different. But the strength of it is the legal system, the justice, the courts. But a covenant is an unconditional pledge based on hope and faith. Under a contract, divorce is an option. If there's infidelity, uh, someone we have time to discuss this morning, I'll uh, leave that up to Scott when he deals with the issue. Scott here yet? Uh, but the under the covenant, the moral obligation is forgiveness. That's the first option, not the last. It's the first. Under a contract, love is basically, see, you know, it's an emotion. Now, in Western society, for the most part, people want to marry the people they they love, right? Whereas in a lot of other cultures, that's not necessarily what happened. Look at Isaac and Rebecca. Did Rebecca marry Isaac out of love? She'd never seen him. She didn't know anything about him. And Isaac had never seen her. He just knew that she was a distant cousin. But in the covenant, love is based on an action, agape. It is a, a doing. It isn't so much a feeling. Now, for all those people, I, I, I'll leave this open here, but all you people that got married, uh, how long did it take for that uh, love, emotion, not to be enough after you got married, after you signed the papers and walked off together? For some, it doesn't take very long at all. Maybe a few minutes, a few hours, uh, and you know, you're, you're together, all right. One plus one equals two. You you got you know, uh, you got two of them. That they're together in the same place, but that's what a contract is. 
But in a covenant, you have one plus one plus one. He was one. Boy, that's bad math, isn't it? Uh, yeah, that's modern. Actually, that's old, old, old math. Ecclesiastes 4.12. Somebody read that, please. Ecclesiastes 4.12. Okay, uh, I've seen people, you take a stick and, you know, uh, you can take a small stick and break it pretty easily. You had to start adding more sticks to it and, you know, kind of twist them around and it becomes pretty strong. And that's the same thing with the, with a rope, with a cord. When it becomes uh, woven together, it is uh, substantially stronger than it was by itself. But in this case, we're talking about the man, the woman, and the one that brought them together. God, the Holy Spirit. Um, under a contract, basically says, I and all that I bring to this marriage will always be mine. It is strictly on loan so that if we find a relationship to be incompatible, then we will retain what we started with and split the remainder. But covenant says, all that I am and who I will become, I give to you to serve, honor, and love for the rest of my life. Notice the difference in the attitude. One is self-centered, and the other is others-centered. And this is the ideal. This is what God is asking us to do in our relationships. Okay, and briefly, we're going to look at uh, why some of the purposes of marriage. Daryl talked about this, so we won't spend much time on it. But uh, one of the basic reasons you get married is, one, you're bored. Uh, you, uh, you think there's more in life. You want to get on with life. You want to get out. You want to have the family. You, you want to have the, the pleasure with the bone of your bones and flesh of your flesh. Um, someone who will recognize you for the, the great person you are and, uh, and just love you to death. Okay, that's, that's, what, that's what pleasure is. Okay, partnership. Basically, this is uh, someone who is a companion. Now, we mentioned last week, I, I brought up about uh, one of our professors said, God made the woman to be a helper or a fit for him, not to give him fits. Uh, but the, the idea is that the helper fit for the task of living and ruling in this world. God gave them several things. It said in the beginning, it said God created, it said male and female created he them. And then it, it said in his image, the let's make man and all in the image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And then he said to them, what did he tell them to do after that? Okay, well, one of the first things, well, go down to the next one, number three. It says, be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. Okay, that comes in the next one, procreation. Reproducing God's image. If they had reproduced at that point, their progeny, their children, would have looked just like God. But that isn't what happened. But they also told him to have dominion over the world. Now, that was before sin ever happened. It says they were to take charge of the world. Now, one of the, the biggest issues right now across the globe, and it's governing our finances, is governing our, uh, our politics, everything, is climate change. Why? Why do people say there's a problem with climate change? Nobody wants to weigh in on that. <laughs> okay, conspiracy theory. They don't like the climate. When it when it's too cold, it's climate change. It used to be global war, uh, global cooling. Then they changed the global warming. Now just climate change, so they can have it either way they want. But they're saying that we're not taking good care of the environment, 
And it, it's kind of funny when they say that because they want to protect all these trees to uh, protect the red-headed, cockaded woodpecker or this uh, owl somewhere or this little tiny flower. Uh, but they have no respect for, for little unborn babies. That doesn't make sense. You can get an enormous fine for disturbing some turtle egg or taking a feather from an eagle. Even when it fell on the ground that the you know, eagle was freely dispensing, uh, you can have a hefty fine there. Um, but God made us to be in control of that. We, I do say we should be good stewards of the environment. We shouldn't be throwing trash out the windows and everything. So, well, it's my right to do it. You know, I can do what I want. Uh, no, that doesn't belong to you. You are a steward. And what is, a, what is a steward? Someone who does what? A caretaker for somebody else. Now, in essence, we are caretakers for God's creation. We're also caretakers for future generations. And if we spoil everything, and right now with our nuclear energy, from what I understand, this is when I was teaching the class, uh, when we had all this leftover stuff, we just buried it in these salt mines, you know, containers, and just, you know, kind of forgot about it. But, uh, but God wants us to be good stewards of that stuff so that other people can use it later and so that he will be glorified from it. Okay. Okay. Uh, Oh yeah, they their their issue isn't about that. There, I I think a whole lot of it has to do with control and power and money and things like that. But uh, procreation, reproducing God's image, okay, that's what God wanted to populate the world with His image. In fact, uh, there are a couple of places in the Scriptures. One's in Isaiah. The other is in Habakkuk chapter two, verse fourteen, it says that He's going to continue with this plan till the earth is. Uh, populated with his image. It says, as the waters cover the seas, he wants his glory to cover the earth. And that's what his ultimate plan is. The, uh, the fourth one is a picture of Christ. I think uh, Daniel hinted at this last time. Even the wedding ceremony and the relationship of Christ and the church is pictured at the very front of the uh, Bible in chapter uh, 1 and 2 of Genesis. But if you look strangely at the end of the Bible, Revelation chapter 21 and 22 also talks about the bride. Uh, so God brought the bride to the man. God brought the bride to church to, to the lamb in the, at the end also. And so the uh, this wedding ceremony and everything, it's a picture of, and some people say it's a picture of the, the Trinity. You have the uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. In our situation, uh, you have male, female, and God the Spirit coming together. But it's just a, a, a picture of that, a rough picture. And how does this happen? By leaving and cleaving. A new family forms. You've got to leave the... Uh, the uh, the family, and it, the instruction was given to the man, and we'll talk about this next week, uh, that he is involved in the leaving, leaving his parents. Um, and I, I call, you know, some of the problems, you've got in-laws and outlaws and ex-laws, uh, and these would be the, uh, the in-laws. You know, leaving those bonds, why? So you can develop a new family, a new bond with, uh, uh, with your wife. Okay, this is pretty much the topic for today. Love and gloves, show me the love. Uh, sometimes it does uh, sort of look like that. Um, together at least. This is understanding your expectations, rights, and roles. What expectations do each person have? But what roles does God give them? And again, roles we're going to look at next week. Matthew Henry wrote, the woman was made of a rib out of the side of Adam, not made out of his head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trembled by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, near his heart to be beloved. 
And he goes on and said, Adam was a figure of him that was to come. For out of the side of Christ, the second Adam, his spouse, the church, was formed. When he slept the sleep, the deep sleep of death upon the cross, in order to which his side was opened, and there came out blood and water, blood to purchase his church, and water to purify it to himself. I don't know if you ever thought about that. The church was born out of the side of Christ, just as woman was born out of the side of Adam. Rights and expectations. Now, uh, you, you may have uh, rights similar to this. These are rights that you, when you went into marriage, you kind of claimed. This is, you know, uh, if you were to write them down ahead of time, you might not have put these down there truthfully. But uh, uh, these are some of the, uh, the ones that uh, people generally have. I call them rights and expectations. Right to the life that I choose. Nobody else has the right to choose how I'm going to live my life. It's, it's my choice. I have the right to love, to be loved, and to be respected. I have the right to the pursuit of happiness. Didn't uh, our Declaration of Independence say that? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Including intimacy when I desire. I have the right to privacy, peace, and quiet. Now, you women are going to laugh at this one here. I have the right to adequate sleep. Uh, last night was not one of those nights. Uh, we had all sorts of things happening. Uh, the last four or five days, our Internet has been down. And since I do these slides and everything, they come from the Internet. Uh, and so I was working you know, a couple of days trying to get that uh, back. But uh, so sleep takes a back uh, seat sometimes. And we were putting up peaches. Gloria was putting peaches last night and then realized that she had frozen but hadn't actually bagged them yet. And so we ended up doing that. And uh, other night fighting ants. So anyway, uh, the right to marry my choice. The right to own and control personal property and do with it what I want. The right to run my own life. Isn't what, what free will? God gave me free will, right? So we have the right to run our own life. I have the right to have the spouse I thought I married. <laughs> Honestly, you look back now to, you know, some of you 20, 30, 40, <laughs> 40 plus years for some of us. Uh, are you still married to the same person you thought you were married to? I have the right to divorce if and when I choose. I have the right to control my environment, including having a clean home. Now, I, I, I felt convicted by this one. Uh, when, I, when I'm studying for a project like this, especially something that's got 10,000 uh, different parameters and facets to it, my books tend to multiply around the room. I've got this 25 by 25 foot room that I, well, it, it's my room. It's got my pool table in there and ping pong table and uh, computer and all of that. But I probably got over 100 books in there spread around too. And, um, but uh, if you looked in there, you wouldn't think that. It, I think she, she puts a puzzle in a little bitty four by four table or two foot, two foot by two foot table and gets buried in there. And so she can't see all of my stuff. Uh, I have the right to make my own rules. My house, my rules, right? Okay, now we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. I think I gave you most of this on your uh, handout there. Uh, and if you didn't get a copy, anybody get a copy? Gonna have this one. So we're not gonna. That's all I got right now. I think there, there, there's one or two back there. Um, there's some physiological differences that you may not have been aware of. As I looked over these things, you know, I've seen this before, and thought, wow, I, when, uh, men have a lower pain threshold. Did you know that? 
Now, now this is generally speaking. So you did know that. Okay, all right. A little splinter can send you into orbit, right? Uh, and women are less susceptible, this is generally speaking, to disease and infections. Um, men are equipped to donate seed for life, uh, but women are equipped to, to bear children. I mean, their bodies are structured to hold and carry a child to birth. Men are generally larger. They have more muscle mass, which translates into power and speed. Uh, you put a, a well-conditioned athlete, male and female, on the same track. Uh, the best women have been able to do, as I've been able to uh, ascertain, uh, just a little bit under 12 seconds for 100 meters. But men have gone down under 10 um, and so that, you know, there's more power, more speed, but women are generally smaller. They have less muscle, but they resist fatigue better and they recover faster. Now, those are things to think about. Uh, men have denser, stronger bones, tendons, and ligaments. Uh, whereas women, beginning at age 14, 51, they, uh, they have more need of iron. Uh, but look at this one here. Information containing number five. Uh, men have more gray matter. But look at the women. They have more white matter connecting the brain, and that means they have larger memory centers than men do. So oftentimes their memories are better. Men are more likely to be night owls than women, but the circadian rhythm of a woman generally slightly less than 24 hours, about six minutes less. They means they get ready, get started again. Uh, they don't need the, you know, it starts over for them less than 24 hours, whereas men are kind of, you know, uh, doesn't vary. Uh, exercise. Men burn uh, carbohydrates to get more calories, whereas women are burning fat. Uh, the men have lower body fat, but the fat they do have is usually carried out front, now, often mimicking uh, pregnant women. Uh, and I'll skip down to number uh, nine. Men have a lower resting heart rate. Uh, all that's not always true. Uh, Gloria and I went to give blood one time, and it was real cold in the uh, church where we were, and both of our heart rate was 45. Uh, so these things are not, not just kind of generally true. But women have a lower peak heart rate, and I'm not sure exactly what that means. Uh, but men have more red blood cells. Uh, they have higher blood pressure. And I didn't know this one either, that women uh, have 50 more neurons in their olfactory uh, department for, for smelling and everything. So uh, it's uh, a different situation. Oh, uh, let me... Uh, I forgot there were, I had a couple of additional notes here when we were talking about rights a minute ago. Um, some of the things that couples need to do before getting married is sit down and, and hammer some of these things out, like uh, the decisions about how many children you want, uh, whether it's zero, one, two, three, seven, or a whole passel of them. Uh, there are some Psalms and Proverbs that will guide you there. A uh, man that has his, uh, what is his quiver full of them is blessed. Um, who is going to get up when the baby cries? Uh, who's going to discipline the, uh, the children, handle the finances? Uh, now those, those type of issues. You know, uh, so often in courtship, 
we're putting our best foot forward, right? We're trying to present the best me that I can. And doing that, we inadvertently, what? Bend the truth a little bit. And then we sign the paper, and then we relax. Now I can be me. I uh, don't realize that that doesn't work too well. A good marriage counsel will reveal many of the pitfalls that the blinded lovers face. Because when you take off the rose-colored glasses and you see that person isn't quite the person that you thought it was. There was a fella that fell in love with this singer uh, up on stage, went to these plays, and he just loved her. Had a whirlwind romance, and they got married, and uh, the first night, <clears throat> They get ready for bed. She takes off her false leg. Mm -hmm. He's not sure what's happening. Then uh, uh, she takes out her false teeth <laughs> and one of her eyes. And he looks at her and says, sing, woman, sing. Uh, many couples uh, still want a church wedding with a pastor. Because they think that true love will always win the day. You know, uh, what is that? What's that movie uh, that we all like? Um, where, you know, the, the true, the, you know, Christy. The Prince's Bride. That's it. Yep. Yep. Uh, they believe that they have found their real soulmates and they don't need counseling. I mean, you know. Love is going to get us through it. Uh, did you know that right now there's no difference in the divorce rate for believers or unbelievers? But I, I did some more research and I found out that it says when believers are committed to attending church regularly together, their rate is 47% less than the general population of believers or uh, nominal believers, non-believers. There was a play I saw many years ago. Some of you may be familiar called Annie, Get Your Gun. Anybody ever hear that? These two people are nose to nose. I mean, they're yelling. They're, you know, uh, saying, you know, I can sing higher. I can sing lower. I can sing longer than you can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can. Yes, I can. Over and over and over. And that's basically the, you know, the gist of the program. Uh, the play. We must realize that God has made us different, not to compete, but to complete each other. Notice that little L makes a lot of difference. <clears throat> Through the uh, history of human beings, the differences have helped men and women survive, mostly working together. Gender differences. The boy thinks you can be anything you want to be when you grow up, an engineer, firefighter, astronaut, pilot. The girl thinks you can be anything you want to be when you grow up, a blonde, brunette. Uh, man uh, is pronounced Ish, and the woman, Ishal. Uh, basically, the man was made to be the initiator. The one who gets things done. He's a doer, a task, uh, work-oriented. Whereas the woman is the responder. She's always in the process of being or becoming. She's home-oriented, more socially oriented. The man thinks logically. He's, he's got more gray matter, so he's thinking of the math and the puzzles and all this stuff. Uh, working, you know, finding solutions where she, a lot of times, has come to the solution by intuition. <laughs> and the man says, that doesn't make sense. Well, finds out that she's right. Uh, she's got more going on up there. Uh, she just bypasses a few steps. Uh, the man needs to feel in charge. Whether he is or not, you know, that's debatable. Uh, all through history, they talk about our presidents, you know. It's the, uh, the wife who's you know, controlling him. But the woman needs to be desired or treasured. She has a need for protection, for cherishing. And again, we'll talk about this a little bit next week. 
Uh, <clears throat> the man is competitive, conquering, bagging it. Now, she wants companionship. She wants you to go out with her to the antique uh, store or the, this place or that. The man's idea, you know, she's thinking about a day, you know, going in there and spending time together and just enjoying dreaming together. What's his thought? Go, go kill it, bag it, and throw it up your shoulder and go home with it. <laughs> yes, where is the chair to sit in? You notice they do have those uh, when you go uh, shopping for clothes, but it's not for the women, it's for the men. Uh, they're aggressive, but uh, the woman, she's interested in cooperation, companionship. She's perpetually active. Uh, the man kind of goes in cycles. Why does he go in cycles? Somebody. He's got to rest because he gives everything he has for a little while, and then that's all he's got. He's got to recharge his batteries. I, I have a, a weed eater like that. I can use it good and hard for about 15 minutes. And then say, I, I got it from Ollie's, you know, Good weed eater. Uh, but men have a fear of age relating to inability to do things, um, to perform. Whereas the woman's fear of age has to do with her appearance. Man needs a completer who encourages him. A woman wants to be a helper, but she's going to keep pushing the limits of his strength. And he does need to be pushed sometimes off the couch. <laughs> the man needs quiet, but the woman needs to be listened to. She isn't always looking for, for answers, although he is ready. To, you, know, it, you know, you present a problem to him. His first thought is, how can I get rid of this? Thing? <laughs> you know, what is the solution? Uh, man needs male bonding and adventure. Female needs adult friends and activities like clubs and uh, just things that she does with the other ladies. Man can be crushed by criticism and lectures, but she's crushed by neglect or from being feeling like she's being used. Um, man stresses the importance of knowing versus her, the importance of caring. Men are generally less depressed that when they are. It's due to some crisis that they're in a fog about how to handle. But her, it could be, who knows, some vague, unidentifiable situation. And it could be physically related. Uh, it could be mentally, emotionally. It could be, you know, something happening way some other place in the world. Men are more eyes or image oriented where women I see more with their emotions. There are uh, other things in here that I left out that uh, uh, you'll just have to get the book and <laughs> read it yourself. Uh, I'll give you a couple of them here. That uh, Men have far more red blood cells, 4.7 to 6.1 million, as opposed to 4.2 to 5.4 million. Uh, but, uh, you know, more men than women are colorblind. But men can sense movement better. I guess they have better peripheral vision. But women can distinguish small differences in color better than the man can. Um, what about children? Let me uh, tell you this brief story here. There's a professor, you know, this, it's called an egalitarian approach to marriage. Everybody's equal. You know, if you give the same set of circumstances, same training, everybody would turn out the same. I, well, we all know that isn't true, but, you know, there's some people that believe in it. This one professor had, these, had all these children uh, for an experiment, said, I'm going to show you uh, that with the right encouragement, training, everything, these girls would be just like these boys. And so it had the little girls in there. And he loaded the room up with trucks and uh, fire trucks and stuff like that and left a little while and said, you know, they're, you know, the little boys, they, they gravitate towards those things, make all kinds of noise and rackets and everything. So we came back in a little while later. And little girls, shh, I'm putting my truck to sleep. I put a blankie over him. 
Um, little girls like to play with uh, toys that have faces, stuffed animals, dolls. Uh, boys are more interested in blocks and manipulatives. Just a, a few minutes ago when we came in, this little boy, somebody's uh, son was in there. He had his little iPod or whatever it was, but he had his toolbox and had the dinosaurs. And he was, it looked like he was trying to hammer something on the top of the toolbox. And uh, so I was thinking, uh, bad idea. Uh, men like to talk about things and activities. What do women like to talk about? Other women. In school, wishes, dreams, and they have secrets. Men, men don't share secrets too often. They're, they're, they're afraid they'll get exposed, and they probably are. Um, women, I, uh, you know, when you go on a trip, women like to have it planned out where, you know, when you turn out of the drive, which way you're going just the other day, uh, we were going to visit some friends and I, uh, you know, I just get in the car, just like a lot of you do get in the car and you, you, you head out and say, well, which way are we going? And, you know, I'll turn right or left, you know, I usually I turn right. And, um, uh, and she said, well, this is the better way. And the, uh, there was a Dr. Henry Brandt was going on a trip with his wife. And I, he ignored her advice and where they were going to go. So he spent quite a few miles trying to figure out how he could turn around without making it obvious. <laughs> uh, men don't usually seek help for problems. And if they have a problem, they're not real likely to share it with a, with a woman. Uh, uh, maybe on YouTube or something, they will go in there and find, you know, how to do this, you know, how to fix this, and they'll do that. But uh, I, women, if you are waiting for a man to share his emotions with you, he might be waiting a long time. Uh, doesn't usually happen. Um, now, um, if a, a, a woman complains that he doesn't listen, he's thinking, well, she's just trying to change me. And when she tries to offer constructive advice or suggestions, he's, what he hears is, you don't think I can do this. And so it's an affront to his manhood. Uh, and he feels vulnerable in relationships, uh, more so than her, because usually she has more friends and emotional support. Again, the home is, he feels like the home is his castle, the place to hang loose. Whereas the home is her what? Was a bird make? Her nest. It's a gathering place. It's a show place. Um, now, some of the differences between uh, the uh, sexes is is cultural and conditioned. But many are physiological and genetic, and some are psychologically determined. And we shouldn't be judging each other on the basis of these, which we frequently do. Um, nor should we attempt to retrain uh oh what was that uh what was it Erwin Lutzer said about when a, a woman comes uh you know the bride's going down the aisle she's thinking three things uh aisle thinking the aisle and then uh what was the second change uh the change is going to happen in their relationship and everything and uh, and then, you know, she's focused on him. I'll change him. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we, we shouldn't go into a relationship thinking that we can change or retrain uh, the person. That's why we tell people it is a bad idea to do evangelistic dating. You know what that is? What is evangelistic dating? Tommy? Like 
De ce? <laughs> okay. But evangelistic dating is that you see somebody you know is not a Christian. You think, well, I'll, I'll bring them to church and I'll take them with me and you know, go to these Bible studies and God will save them through our, you know, through our witness to it. Uh, it does happen, but that's not the norm. So what should we do? Uh, if we try to suppress these, uh, uh, the change, you know, the, the things is wrong with someone else, if we try to suppress them or we try to ignore them, what's going to happen? You ever have these little wind-up toys, the jack-in-the-box? What happens when the timer goes, you know, it reaches the end of the timer and pop, it pops up. Again, kind of a scary thing. And that's what happens in relationships too. You try to suppress or push these things down. But what do we do? We can accept and respect differences in a husband and wife. Learn how God intended us to compliment them. Um, this is a uh, real brief here. These are some of the things that uh, God says in the Bible about a woman. Uh, man uh, finds a good woman, you know, is, you know, he's, it's a good thing. She was made in the image of God, just like man was. Uh, she's custom built to fulfill and complete the man. She is generally, doctrinally considered to be the uh, more vulnerable doctrinally. Uh, a lot of the cults and everything were begun by, by women. First uh, Timothy 2, uh, 14. Generally, she's physically less in strength. But um, she brought tremendous joy to Adam, but then grievous defeat. Pain in childbirth was a result of that. But what also came out of that was a prophesy, the prophecy of the greatest good that came to Mary being the mother of Messiah. Because the, the seed for the redemption of mankind came from Eve, came from the woman, not the man, not from Adam. Uh, tender, loving, compassionate, loyal. Dreams and expectations. She's thinking, it was like a college girl, she's thinking of a knight in shining armor, protecting her honor and offering her security. One who treasures her and values her opinion, wants to listen to her and spend time with her. He's the missing part of me. And he is loved by a gorgeous wife, respect for achievements, time for sports. Achieving what I said I'd do, relaxing home in my man cave. She's going to help me with my work when I need her. My house, my rules. You can see how that there might be some conflict brewing there. Um, the scriptures talk about the requirement for meekness. Uh, anybody have a good definition for meekness? It's similar to humility, a little different. How about strength under control? Jesus said, I am meek and lowly in heart. I don't always have to get my own way. I can submit myself to somebody else to meet their needs. Peter talked about a godly woman is adorned or dressed with a meek and a quiet spirit. And later on in the chapter it says, be ready to give an answer with meekness. When you answer people, when you respond to them, whether it's a criticism or uh, it's an angry outburst or something, respond with meekness. That's strength under control. Because if they're out of control, who's the one who's in control? God, through the one who is, who is meek. Now, you ever notice that most of these rights and everything we talked about a while ago was self-focused? Some were better than others uh, and can be met, but most of these are still not going to give us the total joy that we're looking for in life. John 12, 24 talks about a grain of wheat falling into the ground and doing what? Dying. How is it Dying. And when it reaches the soil and the moisture and everything, the seed begins to crack.
crack open. And the nutrition, the nutrients inside began to sprout into new life. But it couldn't do it until it died to be in a seed. It couldn't be the plant that God intended it to be if that shell never broke, if that shell never died. And it's only as we die to our desires and our rights in this life that we begin to work more in coordination with others. Now, I brought this as an illustration. Uh, one of my favorite uh, people to watch on uh, uh, playing music plays a, a violin, and I don't play. And I didn't know how to hold a thing. Uh, but anyway, I know you had to have two hands to do it, or at least the ones I've seen had two hands. Uh, but I've, I've seen this young girl, she just just pick these with just with her fingers and everything, just incredible. But the more we begin to be in tune with who we are and, and what God made us to be, then the more likely we're able to find harmony uh, in life with, a, with our partner. And it's only when we die to our own desires and, and rights to see what God has for us. I've learned that dying to self isn't easy and it can be humbling. But I've seen that when I give up my expectations and my rights to who? To God. He invariably returns them to me, often improved, but he gives them to me as privileges, not as rights, but as privileges, for which we should eagerly praise him. Um, when we die to ourselves, giving up our rights, even the right to run our own lives, we begin to see things more clearly. We begin to see and appreciate the perspective of other people. So this morning I want to pray, and I've got a prayer here. Before I pray, I have down at the last thing on your page here says, you know, things you should do. Identify your personal rights that you've been claiming. You know, this, 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 this. Transfer them to God. And we're not talking about responsibilities, which we'll talk about next week. But we're talking about rights, expectations, desires. And you can always trust God is going to take good care of his own property, his possessions. Transfer ownership to God in prayer. And thank God whatever happens. But you can expect God to test the results. Let me close with, with this. Uh, this is by C.S. Lewis says, when he talks of losing their selves, he means only abandoning the clamor of self-will. Once they've done that, he really gives them back all their personality and boasts that when they're wholly his, they will be more themselves than ever. When we give ourselves to him, we're freeing ourselves up to be who he intended us to be. And I'll close with this prayer by Hannah Whit uh, Whittall-Smith. Dear Lord, I abandon myself to Thee. I have tried in every way I could think of to manage myself and to make myself what I know I ought to be, but have always failed. Now I'll give it up to Thee. Do Thou take entire possession of me. Work in me all the good pleasure of Your will. Mold and fashion me into such a vessel as seems good to You. I leave myself in Your hands, and I believe You will, according to Your promise, make me into a vessel unto Your own honor, sanctified, and meet for the Master's use, and prepared and do every good work. Amen.